The design of post tension is becoming more and more popular globally, both in residential and commercial spaces. This is because structures can be stronger, span further, and be more efficient. Today I'll be going through the basics of post tension detailing and some of the considerations you need to have over a standard RC design. My name is Brendan, a structural engineer based in Australia, and I provide videos that help progress your career both technically and professionally, and just general interest in structural engineering. So if you do like these topics, don't forget to subscribe. So why should we do a post tension design over a standard RC design? Post tension designs can generally span further, are thinner, are stronger, so they're more efficient all around. This is because of the two primary actions apart from the post tension. The first being a pre-compression force. We all know that concrete is weakest under tension, so adding a pre-compression means that you see higher tensile actions to overcome that pre-compression, thus overcoming concrete's greatest weakness. There's a number of reasons why you can see tensile forces inside a structure, these either being from shrinkage, restraint, flexural actions or strut and tie actions. So by adding that pre-compression, it means you see higher stresses inside that structure before you get tensile cracking. So this comes to the second primary action of post-tensioning, and this is due to the tendon trying to flatten out. So when the tendon tries to flatten out, it imparts a force in the opposite direction to which way it's draped. So for a concave deflection, it's trying to flatten upwards, so it's providing a net upwards force. Or if it's convex, there'll be a net downwards force. So what does this tell us? It means that we can move force from where it's most critical, say like the middle of a structure, to a support line. So we want it to be lowest, where, where the deflections are the higher, or where the highest moments are, and highest, where we have hogging moments, as we're moving the load from where, it, where it's impacting the structure the most to where it impacts the structure the least. So from these two actions, we're able to overcome some of the issues that we have with concrete design. Understanding the secondary actions of post tensioning is important as well. This is most easily explained by the three examples I've up on the screen. So we have a flat tendon above the neutral axis, on the neutral axis, and below the neutral axis. In this example, we'll just assume there is no other net forces imparted than the post tensioning themselves. So when it's on the neutral axis, the only thing that happens is that it slab it shortens from each side. As there is no really net action top and bottom, there's relatively even distributive load. Where it gets exciting is where we have a tendon either above or below the neutral axis. So let's look at above the neutral axis. What happens here? Well, the top of the slab will shorten. This causes the slab to deflect downwards. As you can see, the curvature is forcing the slab downwards. This is due to the action above the post tensioning causing the top tendons to be shortened more so than the bottom. And the inverse will happen as well. When it's on the bottom, it will cause a hogging force. So from this, we can apply this to when we're applying drapes in the structure. Now that we've gone through the primary actions for post tensioning, let's look at where our high points and low sh points should be inside that structure. So where should they be? The easiest way I do this is to have a look at the deflected shape of the side of the structure. As this will show me where the column strips are, where the middle strips are, by looking at the deflected shape, I can see where my low points need to be, as where the structure is deflecting the most is where the tendon needs to be the lowest. This is generally where also the highest tension is inside that structure as well. And again, where it's hogging the most is where we want it to be high. So by balancing out our tendons, depending on, the, on how the structure is behaving, allows us a quick way to first do a preliminary run on our post-tension high and low points. And when we have band beams, which is a beam inside the, the slab, we generally have a high point on either side of that band. And this offers two benefits. Firstly, it increases the parabola of the drape, thus pulling the load more efficiently to where we need it, which is onside that band, and also adds an even distributive load right across that band beam. When you do this, this is not only important for band beams, but also when you've got a flat plate slab. So when you've got a column strip running up and down the page, it's worth putting two high points on either side of that column strip as we'll have the same benefit that you have on side that band beam by increasing the parabola. Now, how about cantilevers? This is where you may go wrong by looking at the deflector shape. Because if you have a look at the deflector shape, you would assume that the tendon needs to be low, low at that point. Yes, it will pull the slab back up, but it'll also not be as efficient as if it was above the neutral axis due to the secondary effects from the pre-compression force. So generally on cantilevers, you want to keep that tendon high to be able to pull the drape back. So this means that that tendon needs to be above the neutral axis and onto the neutral axis at the far point. As this gives you the benefit of two things. It allows you the most efficient way of pulling that tendon up, but also it means that you're applying all the secondary actions as needed above the neutral axis. Now that we've gone through where the high and low points are, how do you do with a fold in the slab? This is as simple as trying to limit how quickly actually diverge the tendon. So you want to try and diverge the tendon very slowly through, through a slab fold. So you roughly want a ratio of about 10 times or eight times the actual step. So if you've got a step of 100 mils, you want somewhere between 800 to a meter. 
that that the divergence actually occurs over. And you also want to ensure that the tendon is diverging all the way through that fold. So you don't diverge it before you get to the fold and, you, and you've stopped the divergence up before you get to the end of that fold as well. So why do you do this? Is because when you're actually draping the tendon similar to a crab, you'll have a net force upwards or downwards, depending on which way the tendon is actually bending. So you want to ensure that you're actually bending it in the deeper section of the slab, not, not the shallower section, as you could cause a net thrust downwards and in extreme cases actually force the tendon outside the slab. So it's just something to be cautious of. Now that we've also talked about diverging slabs around steps and folds, how about voids? Divergence sideways will also cause that same lateral force sideways. So you just want to make sure that you don't diverge the strut too much or too steeply. Otherwise, you'll have a great force going back the other direction. So you try and limit the amount of divergence to about one to one and a half meters and keep it as, as shallow as possible. So if you can keep the similar ratio to what you had in the step. However, again, you try and diverge this tendon before you actually get to the void. So you're not actually imparting a force sideways at that void. We've gone through both where the high points and low short points should be. Now we need to locate where our dead end and live ends are. So what are dead end and live ends? Well, a live end is an end that we stress the tendons from. There'll be generally a jack approach to the tendons that are inside that structure that we stretch up to impart the tension forces with inside that beam structure or slab. And dead end is an end that we're anchoring it from. So generally they splay out and it's an anchorage zone. In both these zones, there's generally bursting forces imparted inside the structure. So generally we have spiral structures around, around those areas to resist those bursting stresses. And you want to make sure that the tendons are not really close to either surface. So generally you want to make sure they're either wherever preferable to be inside the center of the beam to give as much concrete around it, but wherever it's not possible to be within inside 100 mils of either surface. This is generally where you want to locate your live and dead ends. There's also two types of live ends. This is either an ed stress, which is preferable, or a pan stress. Now, what is an ed stress? It's where the live end goes right to the edge of the slab and you stress off the edge of that slab. Now, this is not always possible as you may have issues where you don't have scaffolding on the edge of the slab, so therefore you don't have access to stress it, or you may be stressing adjacent a core. Obviously, you can't stress from the other side of the core as there is a wall in the way, so you, therefore you need to do a pan stress. Generally with pans, you generally need to make sure that you're at least 500 to a meter away to give enough clearance to apply the jack to that structure. And when you're putting a pan in, you need to make sure there's an additional reinforcement in the slab locally in that area to overcome the shortfall from the post tensioning of pulling short. When stressing at the edge of a slab, an area to watch out for is the loss of post tensioning locally between the post tension tendons. So when you stress a tendon at the edge of a slab, there will be a zone of, of about 45 degrees between those tendons where there will be no PNA. Thus, it will not be resisting the cracking or loads in this area. So therefore, you need to have edge reinforcement. So how much post tension do we need inside our structure? There's two ways that I do to work this out. This is the PNA and the load balancing required. The PNA is really to do with crack control. So do we need a low degree of crack control, moderate degree of crack control, or high degree of crack control? And these are applied depending on what degree of crack control we need inside our structure. So low degree of crack control is roughly about 0.7 MPA. And this is generally used in areas where we're not too concerned about shrinkage cracking. So if we've got carpeted surfaces inside a car park or other areas where minor degrees of cracks are not really a concern inside our structure. Moderate degree of crack control, this is typically where you are in most residential or commercial spaces as there is some con concern with cracking. So this is roughly about 1.4 MPA. This means that you should not really see too many shrinkage cracks. And this is generally where we are most of the time. Then high degree of crack control is generally where you've got a wet deck. And this is roughly about 2.5 to 3 MPA. So this is where you can't have the cracking as that cracking will degrade the structure greatly. So you increase your amount of PNA inside your structure to overcome those shrinkage strengths. Now, how about load balancing? As you may remember earlier, I said that the tendons impart a net upwards force onside our structure or downwards force, depending on which way the tendon is going. When we're designing our post-tensioning, we want to make sure they're not balancing any more than about 80%. This is similar to the pre camera steel beams. So why do we do this? Is because if we overbalance the structure, we could have a net hogging force across our structure, which would be detrimental to our design. So generally, we want to make sure that we're about 80%. Now, balancing of the side of the structure has two aspects to it. it has the amount of PNA we have inside that structure and how much drape we have. So depending on which way it's going to be governing, potentially PNA governs, Therefore, we may need to pull up that tendon a bit more. 
or we may need to increase the amount of ten tendons we have inside our structure if we're not balancing it enough. So sometimes we may increase the PNA inside our structure to make sure we're balancing out that structure more. Now that we've gone through the PNA and the load balancing, let's have a quick look to see where they've oversized that structure. I do this through a factor called K. Now K is derived from the Euro code, which is M on BD squared. And it works out the relative stresses inside that cross section. So from this, we can work out the relative steel stress to work out our structure is going to be over reinforced or under reinforced. For a beam to be lightly reinforced, you roughly want to see it about five. This makes for an efficient structure for a beam structure. And for a slab, you want to see about three. Now why three? This is generally because slabs are normally governed by deflection, not by strength. So this is why you see a relatively lower K. Another area we can get tripped up on is having tendons that are either too long or too short. If a tendon is too short, you cannot effectively stress it, thus not imparting the PNA inside your structure. But if a tendon is too long, there's too much friction forces lost along that tendon, thus making it inefficient. So how short is too short? Roughly around six meters is really the shortest you want to go. Anything less than this, you cannot effectively stress it through the elongation of the tendon. And how long is too long? Well, that's roughly around 40 meters. If you're getting up around 40 meters, you need to make sure you're you're flipping live and dead ends to evenly distribute the PNA across that structure. Any more than that really becomes really inefficient and you're only utilizing the steel of the post tensioning instead of the PNA where it's highly effective. Rough tendons, you want to keep them around 12 to 24 meters wherever possible. This is really where you see the biggest benefit from post tensioning. As not only do you get the continuity of the slab, you also get effective PNA inside your slab as well. The bane of any post tension design is restraint. There's many reasons why a slab can be restrained. This can either be blade walls, cores, retention systems, even ramps. So when we're looking at a design, we make sure there's as little restraint as possible. What is the best way to do this? Is to look at a general arrangement plan, which is a plan looking down outside the structure and marking all our restraint locations. And from this, we can see which way the slab is going to want to shrink. Therefore, then we can break up the slab in the locations of where the restraints are to ensure there's only one point of restraint wherever possible. When you're locating the pull joints, you need to consider a couple of things. Firstly, are you going to have permanent or temporary movement joints or just a construction joint? How much can they actually pour in a single day? So how big a pause can you do when you're breaking up your slab? What is the construction methodology, where your PT tendons are to, to accommodate them? So making sure that you've got an even spacing across the slab. Where your band beams are, where do they clash with other walls? So making sure that they align up in logical places throughout your whole structure. So these joints roughly need to be somewhere spaced between 50 to 70 metres. And then you need to have a discussion with how that affects the structure and what other aspects you may need to have in that location. As there will be movement there, the architect just needs to consider jointing things like tiles, for example. There's a couple of ways you can get tripped up like this, and you can see an example up on the page. We have either one example where it's broken up one way, and another example where it's broken up the other. As you can see here with the example on the left, if it was to shrink, it would lock up due to this keying action. So what you might want to make sure is that your keying action is not going to lock up from each other, it's going to move apart from each other. It's just something that can trip you up. Most slabs have a lot of penetrations through them to help service the structure. So whether you've got mechanical ducts, electrical ducts, hydraulics, or even communications. So it's good to know where the good places are to put these and where the bad places are. Now you can't always control this, but by providing something like this to the architect, they can try and impart them where it's going to be impact the structure the least. So I've broken this up based on a two-way slab where your support lines are your column strips, as you can see here, and your green area is your middle strip. As the green area is not supporting anything else, you can have as big a bed entrenchment as they would like, as it does not support affect the support lines. Where on the orange and red strips, there is a support line through there, so we need to be careful with our design. So when we put a penetration in those locations, we want to try and limit it as much as possible or space them out as much as we can. We also need to make sure we carefully design them inside these locations. So inside the Orange areas is our preferred location for those, uh, those penetrations, where in the red is where we really want to try and avoid. The red is where you have the highest stresses in two directions, so it's harder to locate that penetration. It's also the punching zone around that column, so it will reduce our punching perimeter, which is critical for any two-way slab design. So by giving this to the architect, that allows them to easily locate those penetrations early on in locations that are more efficient for inside that structure wherever possible. Please comment below if you have any other tips for any structural engineers for post-signature design. And as always, if you did like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. It helps get this video out to more people. 
and look forward to seeing you in the next episode.